the rules regarding in-kind donations, both from the accounting side, the tax side, and also the valuation side. So with us today, our first presenter is Daniel Figueredo, who's been with BPM for nearly 20 years. He's helped both the firm and clients continue to grow and succeed. His experience in the nonprofit includes working with alternative investments in fair values, as well as making sure to understand uniform guidance and single audit compliance. He's also heavily involved in nonprofits that have had planned giving and significant capital campaigns. He's deeply involved in serving various nonprofit organizations in a wide range, including private foundations, social enterprise, trades, arts and culture, advocacy and political organizations, private schools, community foundations, and higher education. Our second speaker today is Kent Moyer, who is a director in our advisory department specializing in valuations. And he has over 16 years of experience, specifically in these financial advisory matters with a focus on valuation services. He has been a key member of over 100 business and asset valuations over his career. And his experience includes providing services to support anything from forensic matters to dispute resolution and board level and executive decision making. Some of his various valuations include 409A analysis, gift and estate valuations, partnership and shareholder buyout analysis, and purchase price allocation, allocations, and impairment testing, and other value opinions. And our last speaker today is Tammy McNary, and she is focused on our tax consulting practice and has over 28 years of providing both accounting and tax services to nonprofit organizations, as well as to individuals. So she has been able to see these in-kind valuations from both sides, from both the nonprofit as well as the individuals. Please feel free to go on to the BPM's various websites. Our YouTube video site is where most of our on-demand webcasts are saved to at the end of the presentation. And we do have a library of information out there as well as either on LinkedIn or Twitter to follow any nonprofit news and events that we'll be hosting in the future. All right, let's jump into the in-kind accounting side of things. So why why do we care and why do we record gifts in kind, right? It's not like we're getting cash, so why does it matter? Well, a few reasons. It helps to reflect a, a nonprofit organization's true performance, right? Some organizations get significant amounts of, of in-kind contributions, and, and it wouldn't be the full story if you didn't see that reflected on the financials. Uh, we don't want to mislead mislead people in the public as to uh, what, what's really going on at an organization. So uh, when it is significant, uh, it's imp important to reflect those aspects of operations. Uh, in many ways, it can help shed light on financial health of an organization. Uh, if an organization is very dependent on in-kind gifts, what happens if those go away, right? Uh, it's, it's helpful for a reader to understand what's cash basis versus uh, uh, non-cash items and certainly the true cost of operations. Uh, part of what we'll talk about with in-kind donations is, is you record both the revenue and expense associated with those gifts. So uh, the expense side is equally as important. We do have a new accounting standard that is uh, going to be applicable to everyone starting next year. So let's cover that first and then we'll get into some of the basics and we've got plenty of examples in these materials and a lot of extra materials for extra examples and guide guidance. So uh, those are takeaway for you and if we have the chance we'll we'll cover those in this presentation so what do we have going on that's new we have a new accounting and reporting standard around gifts and kind uh, asu 2020-07 and this standard really covers two primary things it, it covers the presentation of these uh, items as well as disclosure of these items on the presentation side what it what it's trying to get at is breaking out on your statement of activities, that's your income statement, a separate line or some separate way to present these non-cash gifts so it doesn't get commingled with uh, cash-related gifts. So that's something that is new and this applies to contributed non-financial assets in the statement of activities. On the disclosure side, we're looking at both quantitative and qualitative disclosures that you're gonna need to put in footnotes. On the quantitative side, you're going, going to need to break down those gifts a bit further. So it's okay to have just one line for those contributions on the statement of activities, but they really want you to tell the reader what are the types of in-kind donations that you receive, whether services or buildings or 
um, supplies, medical supplies, whatever. From a qualitative standpoint, they want a little bit more information around uh, some details around restrictions, uh, valuation approaches, what you consider to be um, key inputs for fair value measurements. So I'll give a little bit more detail on that coming up. This standard is going to be effective for those of you on a junior end. Uh, it'll be June 2022. Uh, it'll be effective. And then if you're a calendar year end, December 2022 as well. So you do have another cycle before this becomes applicable, but uh, just something to start thinking about and planning for. The FASB was very intentional with the use of the term non-financial assets. It's already a defined term in our accounting standards. And what do they mean by non-financial assets? Well, if you were to look up the definition, it would cover the items in here. It could be anything from fixed assets or use of those fixed assets, material supplies and tangibles. Services are included as in the definition of non-financial assets. And we already have some guidance on contributed services in uh, nonprofit gap. So um, that was part of the reason why it was intentional to include uh, the, the broader term of non-financial assets. So qualitative disclosures, they're really looking to understand whether you have a policy to monetize those contributed assets or not, or do you use them in your programs? Do you, um, do you have any donor restrictions associated with those particular assets? Maybe you've got, say you're a land trust and you've got uh, you know, a conservation easement or something on there, or maybe it's used for a specific program, uh, that should be called out as well. And then a bit more about the valuation techniques used to value those assets, uh, what you consider to be your principal market. So uh, a bit of information, and it'll take some thought as to figuring out how you wanna craft this disclosure. This is the financial statement presentation piece of it. This is a pretty straightforward example, right? If the first line is contributions and grants, you can have the second line or some other line be the non-cash items related to contributed goods and services. This is kind of a traditional presentation of a statement of activities, a column for without donor restrictions and a column for with. Okay. Now you could do something else. Let's say you don't have a ton of restricted gifts or you want to emphasize things more in a single, single column format. You could go with uh, unrestricted or without donor restricted items up, up top and then with donor restricted items down at the bottom that can be done in a single column format as well. Uh, you'd still need the lines for the non-cash items, assuming they're significant in material. And then let's say you're somebody that has quite a bit of this, and this is a pretty core part of your activities. I'm thinking, uh, you know, food banks, I'm thinking, you know, thrift shops, maybe uh, in this case, this is an example of say a land trust. Uh, who, you know, for many land trusts, so a key part of what they do is they get contributed land and real estate. They get conservation easements. They're trying to increase their portfolio of land they're protecting. So you could even create a separate column within the without donor restrictions bucket just for those non-cash items. And you could, um, you know, reflect it in, in a manner like I've shown you here as well. So it really just depends on what is going to be best for telling your story and how significant this stuff is. On the expense side of things, the FASB did consider the, that you know, whether they should include any kind of similar breakout for expenses, say in the statement of functional expenses or, or statement of activities. And they concluded there's just not an incremental benefit for the reader. And a lot of times it could be harder, more trouble than it's worth to try to break out the non-cash and, and cash items. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. You're not required to break out anything on the expense side. If, if this was a core item for you and you thought it was important to do, here's an example of what you might consider in the statement of functional expenses. I know we have a few clients where we do this for just because um, they feel that, that showing the non-cash helps tell the, a better story, especially if, if some things start to skew things like fundraising ratios and the like, you can, you can show a bit more, well, you know, maybe our, our fundraising expenses are 60% higher because we get a lot of non-cash uh, items in that area. So you can, you can look at maybe bifurcating things a bit more in your statement of functional expenses as well with the use of subtotals. In terms of quantitative disclosures, you've got uh, an example here, and, and this is pretty much, uh, this and the qualitative disclosures have been adapted from the model disclosure in the, in the accounting standard I referenced. Uh, this would be just a further breakdown of the 
of the types of non-cash gifts that you would get. And then the qualitative piece would be describing the things that I mentioned related to each of those categories. So the ABC, et cetera, footnotes tied to the lines in this table. And then you go on and explain a bit more about how you value these things. What are you, do you use it in your programs? Do you monetize it quickly? Um, so there's a few paragraphs in here that can highlight some different approaches to different types of contributed uh, assets or services. Now, this is certainly uh, perfectly fine to do in your disclosures. If you want to kind of bring it all together in one place, you can do somewhat of a combined disclosure and, and truncate it a bit more. So this type of disclosure, it tries to get to the same point, uh, but in a more concise fashion and in, in a table. So um, you can get creative in terms of how you want to try to think about uh, crafting this disclosure to make the most sense to your reader. So that's about it for the new accounting standard, uh, something to just start planning for. And um, we tend to get a lot of questions around these things and just feel free to reach out if, if something comes up that you wanna bounce around. All right, let's do some quick refresher on in-kind contributions. And I'm gonna go over a bunch of different examples and uh, hopefully this will be fairly straightforward. So with in-kind contributions, the key concept here is to recognize a contribution uh, you you only do that if the item can be used or sold. If you can't do anything with that gift, don't record any. Don't record uh, an item for it. You do measure it at fair value, and that's in accordance with our fair value framework and our accounting standards. And then, if for some reason the contributed uh, item or service, whatever it is, is if you don't have variance power over it, uh, basically where you can't decide on its ultimate use you also don't record a contribution. If you're just an agent or passing something through to someone else, then that is something you, you do not have to worry about recording. In its most basic form, a contribution uh, of in-kind is gonna be uh, the following journal entry. You're going to debit an expense or asset and you're gonna credit uh, some form of contribution income, okay? And uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, you, you'll either an asset side will be if this is something that you're planning to either sell or use in an auction later on, you'll want to reflect it as either inventory or some other type of asset. Now let's talk about another example, items to be sold at fundraising events. So again, you want to record these items when they're initially communicated or pledged to you uh, based on what you know at the time. And then you'll recognize an adjustment once the actual sale or fundraising event occurs. So here's an example uh, where a public radio station gets uh, a contributed vehicle. They, you know, based on their assessment, think it's worth $5,000 on the date of that gift. So they put it into their inventory for $5,000. They plan to sell it at their auction or use it in their pledge drive. Um, once it's ultimately um, disposed of, uh, I guess in this case they sold it. So um, they actually only got $4,000 for it. And if there's a cutoff period in here, then you would want to reflect these, these two distinct entries. Uh, they got 4,000 of cash and then they have to reduce that contribution at a later date by $1,000 because their initial estimate was just a little too high. Next item, if you get a contributed use of long-lived assets, let's say free rent or reduced rent, you also want to reflect that on your financial statements. So uh, in this example, let's, let's talk about a quick overview here. You would, you would come up with a fair value based on your uh, assessment of what's the market rate for the rent uh, based on the period promised. If you do have, say, a long-term uh, lease agreement in this case, let's say it's for more than one year, you would want to reflect the contribution receivable for that long-term promise, uh, even though uh, you're only using it for a certain amount of months of the year. Well, you never want the fair value to exceed what's the fair value of the asset, right? So if, if, if a contribution of real estate for 30 years is a certain value, but you're talking about a 25 year old building and it's, it's net book values, maybe something less, uh, you wanna make sure to compare the two against each other. In our simple example here, we just have a discounted rent that a landlord is charging. So it's normally 15,000 a year, but uh, he's giving it to you for 10,000 a year. And so what you would do here is you would still reflect the 15,000 of rent expense as your debit, but you would 
show a contribution of 5,000 uh, for the difference and 10,000 would be the cash that would go out the door. All right, let's move on to contributed services and we have a few examples here. With contributed services, you want to uh, make sure that you meet either of these criteria for recording a contributed service. The first criteria that you can use is that it, it creates or enhances a non-financial asset or it can, if it doesn't do that, then it either needs to require, it needs to require specialized skills. Uh, also, it would need to typically be purchased by the organization and it needs to be provided by the people that have those skills. So let's do a quick example here of what I'm talking about. So let's say we have a mental health center. They have, uh, they get volunteer services, uh, both from a, a licensed counselor and uh, those, those counselors also train community volunteers to assist in the counseling. And so do you record an in-kind contribution for those counselors? And we go through the first part of the assessment. Is there an asset involved that's being enhanced? No, there's no you know, building or anything that's being created. So then we go through the second uh, option and each of the decisions, you know, is there somebody that has a specialized skill? Yes, as a licensed counselor, that would be yes. Um, is that something that they would typically need to be purchased? Uh, would typically purchase if it wasn't donated? Well, that's kind of what the organization's all about. So they probably would purchase it. And then is the person that is providing that service, uh, do they possess those skills? And yes, that counselor is doing exactly what they have the special skill for. So that's a pretty straightforward example. Now, uh, maybe you can throw in the chat here, what do you think about the volunteers? Do you think we would, uh, how would we fare whether we record that or not? Maybe just type in a simple yes or no, or if you have any other thoughts, you can type in why you think yes or no. I've got a couple of no's initially. Somebody says this is not a specialized service. I've got no here as well. So thank you for that. Well, uh, what's the difference in the fact pattern? Well, there's still a specialized skill, which maybe the volunteers um, might be trained in. Uh, they, certainly it still needs to be purchased if it wasn't donated, but are those volunteers somebody that have those skills and licenses? No, they aren't licensed counselors. So I would probably not record uh, an in-kind contributed service for those people. So do we record a contribution for that, that service? And certainly it's not enhancing an asset. Um, there's certainly a specialized skill involved with, with uh, um, somebody managing an investment portfolio. Uh, there's certainly a, a service that would typically need to be purchased if not contributed, but our out here is that this person does not possess that skill, right? They're not a, they're not certified uh, financial planner or uh, have their series seven, whatever the, the requirement is. So no, you would not record that contribution. Next item here is uh, another example where you've got a local shelter building a new, ho new housing. You've got an architect volunteering their time and you've got community volunteers. Um, what do you do about those community volunteers? Do you record that contribution? And you might be starting to go through that assessment of specialized skill and all that stuff, but don't forget the first example, which is, is there an asset being enhanced or created? And even though these people may not be certified licensed roofers, they are creating an asset for somebody. And so you would record that because of the fact that they are doing that. You might say, who would want to donate? Uh, who would want to accept roofing donated from volunteers? And I, I will say, uh, you know, one of the things when I was uh, an intern in college, a great program I participated in was the Inroads program, a great nonprofit. Um, was back home in Las Vegas uh, interning uh, for accounting at Enterprise Rent-A-Car and my end of internship project was to do a community service project with Habitat for Humanity and uh, you know in the Las Vegas heat they had us working on the roofing of the houses that we were volunteering to build so uh, that is something that people do trust volunteers to help with. Um, all right services from affiliates this is uh you know something that i think of kind of my alma mater here uh, usf uh, when thinking about this concept this is when somebody else is contributing services to your nonprofit organization i often think about this with like corporate foundations when the staff of the corporations donating their time 
I also think about it a lot of times like in the religious space. Uh, there's a lot of, of people like, like at USF, the Jesuits do teach in the classroom a lot of times. So with services from affiliates, you do look at something like, um, you know, you would basically measure it either at the cost to the affiliate or the fair value if the cost is significantly overstated or understated, right? So in the case with USF, they obviously don't pay for the Jesuits to teach the classes, but there is a fair value. If, if they didn't teach it, there is a teacher that would need to be paid to teach that class. And so you would use the other option here and measure the fair value of, of what it costs to, to have a teacher for that class. So that's something that you may uh, run across with services from affiliates. Otherwise, for the corporate foundations and the like, it's just what did they pay that person in their position? Uh, what's their hourly rate and, and use that. All right, let's jump into a few issues here. Um, goods versus services. There's, there's uh, some items in here like around media time and the like. You want to basically only record a contribution if you get something uh, with a future economic benefit and you can also control that benefit. So you get some radio time uh, for free. You get some airtime. You certainly want to record that uh, contribution for that free airtime. If somebody does a public service announcement for you, but you don't really have control over that message, then you don't really need to record a contribution because it wasn't something that, that you were a part of. Board members, that's a very common item. Like, do I record pro bono services for my board members? And the answer is it really depends on, on, on what's going on here. Uh, a lot of times there's an expectation as a fiduciary of the organization to do what the board member can do to help, help the organization out. So there's a bit of an expectation that comes along with their board service. And you know, they oftentimes board members include lawyers, accountants, uh, architects, consultants, et cetera. So in this example, if we've got a board member that's a lawyer and they're using their, their law background to help with um, pro bono advice on governance and contracts and things, that probably falls more in line with standard fiduciary responsibilities where that, that maybe they don't aren't required to do that, but that's more in line with what they would do as a fiduciary of the organization. So probably don't record a contribution for that. But if we're talking into more specific matters, especially that you would need to pay for um, like a lawsuit and their firm is representing you and providing extensive defense uh, services, that sort of stuff, you probably would look to record a contribution there because it's probably above and beyond than something that's just a general pro bono, pro bono service. Uh, we have a little bit here on marketable securities. I won't cover the example in great detail, but yes, do record those marketable securities at their fair value. And there's journal entries in here to help you sort through what are the changes that happen from the day it's promised all the way to the day that you sell those securities. And then we've got bargain purchases, which is dealing with um, if you get something at a discount, right? So let's say an architect is donating um, their time to you and they're doing it at a dis discounted price. You need to understand if you're getting a bargain purchase versus, you know, just a competitive bidding process. So sometimes it's a little hard to tell, so you don't have to necessarily do an exhaustive search, but if it's, if it's pretty evident that you're getting something um, at, a, at a significant discount to what, what would be normal market conditions, you would wanna reflect that as a contribution. So in this example here, they're charging you 500,000 for their service when it's probably worth 800,000, uh, you would wanna reflect that $300,000 as a contribution and likely that would get capitalized to the construction project. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears into fair value briefly and just go over some key concepts of fair value. Fair value is an important piece of the uh, in-kind contributions because there's a lot of uh, ifs in this, in this space. So let's start with a quick breakdown of fair value. Um, first off, fair value is based on a concept of an exit price. What can I sell this thing for? Uh, it also needs to be something that's a, an orderly transaction. Uh, when you think about your market participants, you need to think about what's the principal market and or the most advantageous market uh, where you can get the highest and best use for that item. Um, so you want to keep all those things in mind when you're thinking about fair value. When you do fair value, there's actually three approaches that are in our accounting standards. There's a market approach, a cost approach, and an income approach. And sometimes you might pick one of these, and sometimes you might pick a combination of these 
to value a particular asset. Folks like Kemp will do all these different approaches when they're when he's coming up with a value, and then and then he'll log, he'll use reasoning for figuring out how to get to the um, identified fair value when he when he does his valuations. The AICPA has a nice free flowchart that you can use. So this is the first half of that flowchart when thinking about how to fair value something. So uh, first, you need to decide what it is that you're what you have. Is it a t-shirt or it is a box of t-shirts, you know, what's your unit of account? Then you have to figure out what's the best and highest use for that item. And it's important to keep in mind your perspective as a market participant. Um, you don't want to keep in mind that you know, the fact that this is being donated for free to people in the community, that doesn't mean that this gets no value. You have to think about what would uh, otherwise, what would be the price that I'd have to transact for these t-shirts in this example and, and use that. Uh, you have to figure out what is an observable market or not. And if there is not an observable market, then you have to come up with one in the, what we call hypothetical transaction. After you do that, you would figure out what is considered the principal market and or most advantageous market, and then uh, apply your valuation decisions from there. So there's a lot of things that go into the decision process here that's more than just you know, taking say the, the Zillow price for donated real estate, maybe that might be fine, but you have to, you know, go through that decision process to say, well, is Zillow uh, a good you know, market for, you know, real estate in my area? How do I figure out that it meets all these criteria? So let's talk about a few of the issues that you have here. Uh, one could be legal restrictions. So you have to take into account what is behind that gift. Uh, and, and that might impact the value. If something is more of an asset restriction, then it probably does impact the value. If it's more of just a donor restriction, that's probably more just on how you use the asset, and that probably won't impact the value. So make sure you understand what those restrictions are. In the first example here, we have a land trust that gets a, a gift that is a property with a con conservation easement. So that would be a clear example of an asset restriction where because this property now has to be used for, it can't be used for any other purpose than staying as conserved property, um, it's gonna be a much lower price than if I was able to do whatever I wanted with it and sell it in a, in a retail environment. Versus example two, a donor might have just have a, a restriction like, um, let's say Nike or somebody donates a bunch of shoes, but they say you have to distribute these shoes outside of the U.S. I don't want you to um, to disrupt necessarily Nike's brand in the U.S. Um, so you can use it in your programs uh, outside of the country. That's not going to really impact the value of those shoes. It's just a matter of a donor restriction. Hypothetical transaction, gift in kind, uh, something here that you can... Um, you know, in this particular item, um, if something's rarely bought or sold, you might you might need to de be developing your own hypothetical transaction. It's typically a, a level three type of measurement in the fair value hierarchy. You don't have to do a crazy search to figure out, you know, who are my market participants, but you must use a, information that is available to you and at least uh, factor that into the transaction. You want to understand where your role is in the in the process. So uh, you know, let's take those that those clothing items, or you know, one of my clients has has glasses that they get donated for their programs. Um, you know, your perspective from a manufacturer could be totally different than a retailer, right? So where are you in that cycle so that you know you aren't necessarily applying a retail price to something that maybe you're thinking about it from a whole, wholesaler perspective. And that's exactly what happened in our, with our client that has the glasses, right? If they were to apply a retail price, it would totally overstate the value of what they're getting when they're actually just more or less getting glasses at, at wholesale to be able to distribute them to their programs uh, around the world. Principal market, just keep in mind whose perspective you need to have, uh, whether the beneficiaries or your donors or the commercial markets don't worry about your, your beneficiaries. You don't take their perspective in this. It's typically gonna be where there's, where there's actual activity and trade going on. So understand that for figuring out the principal market. And I'll give you the example here, just to go over that with you. So in this example with which you're answering the, the question, um, 
We've got a U.S. relief organization giving medical supplies for COVID-19 efforts in India. Uh, obviously, their beneficiaries are in India, and they don't have a way to obviously pay for the distributed supplies. Donors do come from distributors in the U.S., and then um, they are purchasing a lot of their supplies in China. And so what do you think is the principal market? And it looks like most of you are saying the U.S. And uh, yes, you would see that the um, U.S. market is where you've had the highest volume of sales and activity. And based on this fact pattern uh, in terms of market participants, that's where you would evaluate it. I'll touch and, on, I think, go ahead, Shin. I was going to say, Daniel, we did have another question that came through, um, and it was really in regards to the rent discount. And one of the questions was noted that a few years ago, they were told that the discount on services could no longer be considered a gift and kind donation. And so the question is, if discounted services can't be considered a gift and kind donation, why wouldn't that apply to a rent discount? In, I, in terms of they were told by somebody, I, I'd probably have to understand the, the fact pattern there. But uh, typically, if you're getting something like discounted rent, you certainly free rent for sure. Discounted rent is probably something you can figure out as well. Um, and yeah, that's something you would want to figure out if that's worth um, recording or not. I need to understand a little bit more of your fact pattern, but but. Uh, just getting discounted services. Again, it's, it's discounts can often be a, a market con condition, right? For nonprofits where that's just the customary thing for a certain area. And, and certainly that may be something you don't record, but if it's something that's clearly below what would be otherwise a market price for a nonprofit, um, that's something to keep in mind. So this last concept here is just on variance power. That's something I talked about earlier. And again, variance power means you have control of the item that's being donated. And if you don't have control, then that means that the donor is deciding and you're more, more likely going to be an agent as opposed to the, the principal in the transaction. So unless you specifically get approval from the donor, something like I will donate this, these medical supplies to this organization, but if I can't find, if I find a more suitable organization, I have your approval to distribute it elsewhere. That's variance power. You have the right to use it however you want or with another party. If they're just telling you to give it to the X organization and you're just the conduit, then uh, you don't have variance power and you would not record a contribution. Fantastic information. Uh, this is one of the reasons I love being a BPM. Um, super smart people that know accounting ins and outs and I'm the, the valuation guy that comes in and, and, and plugs in, in where needed around that, uh, that framework. So um, really great information, some of which I knew, some of which I didn't. So I hope all of you in the audience are um, learning as much as I am listening to, to Daniel and team speak. Uh, but yeah, my, my piece here, uh, uh, I'm the valuation guy, over 15 years experience in, in valuation, primarily here in the, in the Bay Area. Um, I also, uh, a little bit of a tidbit, I, I do have experience uh, in the nonprofit segment operationally. Uh, I coached high school football for 15 years. And uh, uh, as part of that, we had two um, nonprofit uh, 501c3 organizations that were involved, one directly at the, the program level and one at the uh, athletic boosters. So uh, uh, I, I, I know some of the ins and outs from, from that side and, and obviously the amount of uh, uh, legwork and, and overall processes that, that come into play. So all you folks uh, operating in, in the nonprofit space, uh, my hat's off to you. Um, and hopefully we can be of service as you fulfill your mission. So Daniel touched on fair value, which we have substantial expertise in um, from the valuation side. Um, but also today, I want to speak a bit more also about fair market value. Uh, traditionally, um, kind of easy way to bucket it um, for, for general reference is, is fair value is the, is the accounting side. So kind of the, the gap financial reporting. And then fair market value is, is usually the, the tax side. So kind of the the IRS requirements, um, uh, tax elements that have to be taken into account. There, these two generally um, marry up pretty well, um, but there are some nuanced differences, and it is important to, you know, take those into account and have the proper understanding and, and kind of professional guidance where needed 
to navigate the, the nuanced differences. Um, as it relates to fair market value specifically, um, you know, this is as we relate to, to property and uh, uh, donations and whatnot, um, to figure how much you may deduct for property to contribute, you must first determine its fair market value on the date of contribution. So kind of similar to, to fair value, um, but, but again, that nuance, the fair market value is a price that property would sell for on the open market, kind of the, you know, effectively the highest and best use. Um, it is a price that would be agreed upon between a willing buyer and a willing seller um, with neither being required to act. So no compulsion involved, no forced sale, et cetera. And both having reasonable knowledge of the relevant facts. So informed buyer, informed seller. Um, if you put a restriction on the use of property, you donate the fair market value must reflect that restriction. So similarly to Daniel's commentary around fair value and financial reporting, um, the tax requirements require similar um, applicability. So again, some nuances between the two and um, you know, professionals will be able to help guide you um, along reporting for, for each, um, but also important to be aware of, the, of those nuanced differences. So yeah, Daniel additionally did touch on many of the uh, non-cash uh, charitable donations. Um, and, and I love the, uh, the question at the beginning of the, the unique um, contributions. Um, I, I've definitely seen some unique ones in my time, but some on, the, on that list, uh, you know, go far beyond, um, you know, uh, the, the kind of the unique uh, donations that I've seen. But, but these, are, these are some of the more common ones, um, certainly. Um, uh, company stock or other securities. And now I do believe this would fall in the bucket of the, the financial contributions, but certainly our, our donations that nonprofits and their donor, donors um, will want to be aware of and understand that they need to develop, um, you know, fair market value for, for those securities. Obviously, public securities, it's quite a bit easier um, as, you know, you go look at the, the stock price for Apple shares um, you can pretty much grab that, um, you know, any given day. Um, so unless there are restrictions on the shares, right, you're going to have your public price. Um, whereas private securities, right, there's not that, um, that market, um, you know, to go and grab that level one evidence that, that, that Daniel referenced. Um, so in which case there, there do need to be um, you know, methodologies developed to conclude on what the fair market value is of those private securities. So, um, you know, here in the Bay Area, obviously, uh, uh, but also I know that there are probably folks that are, that are not in Bay Area here, but, you know, uh, dynamic economy and, and certainly uh, donors that, uh, that would like to support um, uh, their nonprofit causes um, with donations of, of securities. So uh, uh, it's, it's one to certainly, um, you know, be aware of and, and properly have accounted for. Uh, certainly as well along those lines, and, and David, or Daniel did touch on it, but the, uh, the real estate or property um, that, that may be commercial, that may be residential, that may be open space, um, et cetera. Um, but yeah, and certainly a piece of, uh, uh, of awareness to have is, is whether that, that property has any restrictions on it. And that circles back up to the, the securities as well. The securities themselves may also have restrictions, um, in which case that would have to be accounted for in the in the analysis, right? Um, bullet three here, vehicles. Um, I actually recently, uh, and circling back to the fair value point, recently have done some work on a, uh, 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 as it relate to forklifts. Um, so forklift uh, fair valuation, but uh, um, you know, any vehicles, uh, if, you, if you listen to Bay Area Sports, you know, the 1-800 Cars for Kids song has probably been drilled in your head. Um, yeah, they're looking specifically for vehicle donations and, and certainly, those happen, um, you know, commonly. Uh, that may be boats, that may be, uh, you know, motor vehicles, RVs, um, you name it. But uh, certainly, common common donations. Artwork, uh, again, as Daniel touched on, and this is one space that I personally have not not really touched. Um, you know, art is kind of, I mean, it's art. You know, so there's very little science, you know, behind um, the pricing there. Not a lot of numbers involved as far as uh, you know, cash flow analysis or et cetera. It's kind of a, a nuanced piece, but, but certainly art donations um, happen often. Um, we see quite a bit here at BPM, the digital assets and, and cryptocurrency. Um, and similar to the public securities, there are times where, you know, some of these markets are trading literally 24 seven. 
um, but also times where there might be restrictions or there might be digital assets or crypto that does not have the, uh, you know, the substantial uh, marketplace um, and, and that may need a deeper look. Um, furniture or fixtures, um, you know, other fixed assets, um, you know, that, that may be donated. Uh, jewelry, gems, rare coins, there might be donation of, of gold, silver, um, you know, historical artifacts, things of that nature. Um, sports or entertainment memorabilia, tickets, suites, obviously COVID, uh, you know, put a, a bit of a pause on that, but we're now starting to, you know, see that, you know, come back into play. Um, I actually did, uh, you know, an appraisal for uh, some Warriors uh, suites um, in their first year at the Chase Center, though. so that was kind of an interesting one. Uh, but yeah, donated to a, uh, to a nonprofit and they needed to file um, the fair market value of that. Um, additionally, patents or intellectual property. I've seen this uh, a couple times in the education space where, um, you know, business or individual may donate, um, you know, a, a, an educational platform or some content. Um, so the, the, that, that is a, a non-cash donation that would need a fair market value. And, and really, you know, added et cetera there because as you guys listed on the, uh, in the initial question there, you name it, it's probably been donated. So um, just some, obviously a list there. Um, key considerations for uh, FMV for in-kind donations. Um, obviously the, the cost or the selling price of the items, um, you know, again, that, that may be the cost of, of the acquisition, um, but also the, you know, an actual or um, similar selling price in the marketplace for um, such items, um, which is bullet point two, sales of comparable properties or items, depending on what the, the asset is, there may or may not be very good comparables, right? So that's part of the process of the evaluation. Is there something exactly similar? Is there something that's a bit similar? How do we kind of determine what a comparable list of of assets or items are. Um, yeah, third here, replacement cost. Uh, if you, you know, say the IP library, right? What would it take to develop or, or rebuild that library um, you know, from, from scratch rather than it being uh, donated across? And then you know, opinions of experts that might be valuation experts that see similar, that may be experts in the particular field. Um, these are elements that should be a part of the process of, of kind of defining and, and ultimately concluding um, for the FMV. Certain key factors um, for FMV analysis and reporting, um, uh, you know, if it, you know, the cost or the selling price, if you consider that factor, certain questions to ask, uh, was the purchase or sale of the property reasonably close to the date, right? Did this, was there a sale three months ago or was a sale a year and a half or five years ago, right? It was the, that, that timing element is a key consideration. Um, was any increase or decrease in value as compared to your cost at reasonable rate? Um, currently working on an analysis where um, uh, uh, property was purchased in January of 2020 and uh, changed hands in April of 2020. And that's kind of right when COVID really hit. So there's actually, even though it's only a few months out, there was actually a substantial change in value, even though it was uh, only a three month time period. So uh, those type of considerations in terms of does a change in, 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 in value make sense, right? Um, do the terms of purchase or sale limit what can be done with the property, right? We kind of touched on the restrictions and that, that certainly may come into play for, for nonprofits. Um, was there an arm's length offer to buy the property close to the valuation date? I'm pretty straightforward there. Um, when considering the sales of comparable properties, this is kind of a, a market-based analysis. You know, how similar is the property that you're using as a comparable to the property that was donated? Um, how close to the date? Again, that, that, that element of timing, right? Markets are very dynamic and they change. There's volatility. So it, was it very, uh, you know, a week apart? Was it was it a long time apart where the, where the value might have changed? Was a sale at arm's length? You know, whether it, was, it might be related parties and that might not give you that indication of true, of true fair market value. Um, what was the condition of the market at the time of the sale? Again, you know, COVID, it gives us a, a prime example, right? There might be times where the market is not as orderly, um, you know, given some um, unique 
set of circumstances, right? If something sells, uh, let's think about toilet paper at that time, right? Some of this stuff was spiking in price and people were hoarding it. That might not be the best representation of the real value of toilet paper. So that kind of extreme example there, but it certainly happens in the market. So something to be aware of and consider, um, you know, when thinking about replacement cost, right? What would it cost to replace the donated property? Um, you know, if you had to go out and buy it rather than, uh, than, than acquire it via gift, um, is there a reasonable relationship between replacement cost and fair market value? This is where, you know, maybe the art portion kind of gets off the rails, right? Because it's, right, there might not be a, a replacement for the, if it's one of one, and we see this, we see some of these NFTs these days, you might have stuff like that where it's, there really isn't a replacement. Okay, it might be a comparable, but, but how, do you, uh, how do you define that one piece, right? Um, and then is the supply of the donated property more or less than the demand for it? Again, you know, markets, um, you know, scarcity might impact markets. Um, supply relative to demand is a key component. We kind of have been seeing that more lately. Um, and then finally, opinions of experts. Uh, is the expert knowledgeable and competent? You know, does the individual pining, um, you know, do they, do they know what they're talking about? Frankly, have they had experience with this? Are they able to demonstrate that they understand the, the fact pattern, um, the circumstances involved? Um, and is in opinion thorough and supported by facts and experience, right? You want to sum up valuation. It's kind of halfway between, um, you know, accounting and law. And so you have numbers and you also have kind of making a case, telling a story. So having that story and that case makes sense and be supportable by the, by the numbers and, and the overall landscape, very important um, to the process. Daniel, if you want to hit the next slide. So yeah, the, the traditional valuation methods and, and, and Daniel touched on, on these in the fair value, they uh, directly correlate with fair market value. So these would cover your bases for, for both standards. Um, you know, you have your income approaches. Um, this is more, of, uh, more applicable for maybe, uh, you know, income generating property, uh, private held, privately held business shares, uh, fixed income securities, right? So it might be more financial or, you know, real estate, but it's kind of, okay, this, this, this asset is generating um, some cash flow. Um, you can, you know, model that out and create a, 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 an estimate of value as of the, the current date or the valuation date based on, on that future outlook. And uh, kind of related to that is capitalization of cash flows is kind of more of a stable, um, stable income stream, right? DCF might make more sense if there's a lot of volatility or a change, you know, projected that, that are there regrowth or regression, whereas capitalization method is more of a, a uh, you know, just consistent cash flow. Market approach, I mean, a good uh, example here is if you're, you know, buying or selling a house, um, you know, the comps, the comps in the neighborhood. And again, the timing, you know, how recent were the comps, the volume, are there are there only one or two or are there, you know, 10 or 20 comparables you could touch on um, that happens with, you know, businesses or vehicles, et cetera. Um, right. So it's a good one for, for when there's an active market, maybe of not that exact same property or, or, or good or service, but similar, right. And then similar to guideline transactions, guideline comparables is a little bit more if there's ongoing public market, you know, kind of public companies, Guideline transactions, that's kind of the houses or the, uh, you know, uh, real estate property, vehicles, et cetera. Um, and then transactions of the same security or asset. So if you have like for like, right, it's the exact same, then that is a very good indicator of value for the, the, the asset that, that's being donated. Uh, finally, uh, asset approaches. So again, we kind of touched on it, you know, replacement costs. What would it cost to rebuild this IP library or uh, you know, buy a new or a not a new, but a, a used uh, forklift similar to the one being uh, transferred. Um, and then net asset value method, that might be more if there are, you know, if it's an LLC or holding company shares, you know, you might have a donation of shares and they own property within the LLC. There might be, you know, kind of look at the, the assets, net the liabilities and kind of get to a net asset value method. But that'll be more for a passive um, portfolio 
rather than kind of an active operating company. Yeah, some common challenges uh, as we go through the process. One, uh, the last question kind of presents one is just the nuances, uh, you know, of the, uh, you know, what, at what level of, of market are we, are we kind of talking about there? But, but certainly there's some others, um, and again, touched on it, but the unusual market conditions, um, you know, again, we, the IRS, the, the, you know, GAP, they all prefer to see an arm's length transaction as a driver for the best evidence of value. Um, but not all transactions, you know, reflect normal or orderly arm's length conditions. So the transactions themselves that are representative need to be assessed to make sure, okay, was this an arm's length indicative value? Um, two here, selection of comparable sales. Again, how similar are they? Are they, is it the exact same, you know, asset or is it something that's kind of the same, but maybe not quite, maybe a similar company or the house down the street as, you know, a bigger yard, you know, how do we take into account those, those nuanced differences? And then again, create support for why the comparable sales support the value conclusion. Again, as we talk about the, the properties, what are the, the qualitative elements that differ them and why should, you know, how does that reasonably impact that, that conclusion, you know, up or down? Um, future events, um, you know, must assess what is known knowable for account while accounting for reasonable risk, right? If you, if you had a, a donation that happened, you know, right before a, uh, you know, a natural disaster, you know, God forbid. But if, if you do, if that happens and then, you know, there's a disaster that changed the value, right? You didn't, at, at the time of the, the, the donation, no one could know or it wouldn't be knowable that that subsequent event would happen, even if it's very close to the same date. So that's a, a stark example, but, you know, there are obviously changes that happen between when the gift happens and when it's reported. So we have to kind of put ourselves in the shoes of what was known knowable at that, at that time. And then also just keeping in mind using past events to predict the future, um, it may or may not, right? That's an assessment that needs to happen. The past events may reflect that future outlook, but they absolutely also may not. So understanding and again, presenting a case that, that defines that is, is important. Uh, a qualified appraisal. So the you know the IRS specifically has uh, you know uh, relatively uh, detailed you know guidance on on you know what that is. Um, uh, but you know generally, if the the claim deduction for an item or group of similar items of donated property is more than five thousand, um, uh, you must get a qualified appraisal signed and dated by a qualified appraiser. Um, uh, then there's a taxpayer. Taxpayer must also complete. Form 8283, Section B, and attach it to the tax return. I believe Tammy will get into a, a bit more of that uh, later. Um, but uh, just kind of continuing here, um, a qualified appraisal is an appraisal document that is made, signed, and dated by a qualified appraiser in accordance with generally accepted appraisal standards. So kind of what Daniel and I have been, been talking about, some of these, these key standards and considerations um, uh, qualified appraisal meets the, the relevant requirements of re reg section one. You see the, the, the numbers and letters there. Um, it's got to check the, the critical boxes that the IRS has defined. Um, a key consideration we talked about is the timing is dated no earlier than 60 days before the date of the contribution and no later than the date of contribution. So it can't be after the fact. For an appraisal report dated on or after the date of contribution, the valuation effective date must be the date of the contribution made not earlier than 60 days before the date of contribution of the appraised property. So again, timing is critical. Again, the IRS understands markets are dynamic, so you can't use a, a very um, a dated appraisal for, for filing. And uh, it must not involve a prohibited appraisal fee. That might be something where the appraisal fee is result uh, determined by the results or in some way uh, contingent upon some finding um, or something along those lines. Uh, a qualified appraisal, appraiser, excuse me. Uh, a qualified appraiser is an uh, individual or, uh, you know, entity. I mean, ultimately an individual must sign. So uh, effectively an individual with verifiable education and experience in valuing the type of property for which the appraisal is performed. Um, uh, this, this individual has earned an appraisal designation from a generally recognized professional appraiser organization. Um, that may be CDA, that may be ASA, that may be CFA, 
um, CPAs um, with, the, with, with various designations, et cetera. Um, and this individual has met certain minimum education requirements and in, in two or more years of experience uh, minimum. Uh, the individual regularly prepares appraisals for which he or she is paid, and the individual is not an excluded individual. There are certain uh, you know, nuances there, um, but really uh, you know, stay out of hot water with the IRS. Um, excluded individuals, additionally to those that may have uh, had, had issues, but the donor of the property right, can't complete the, the appraisal, um, or the taxpayer who claims the deduction. Um, uh, Conversely, the, the donee, the receiver of the property, cannot um, you know, complete the, the appraisal. Um, and, and any party to the transaction um, in which a donor acquired the property being appraised, unless the property is donated within two months of the date of acquisition, and, and its appraised value is not more than its acquisition price. So this, this applies to the person who sold, exchanged, or gave the property to the donor or any person who acted as an agent for the transfer or donor in the transaction, and as well, any person employed by any of the above persons. So effectively, you need to be independent, right? You need an independent appraisal. Okay, so now we're moving on to tax, and um, a lot of these rules regarding the, the, the gap side of things and the book side of things are not applicable for tax. So we're gonna go over some of the differences um, so for in-kind gifts where you are recording contributed facilities like space or vacation home usage, uh, we don't recognize that for tax. So you'll, you know, do that valuation on the book side and then for tax, we reverse it. So, and that would also apply to donated services. So things like legal services, pro bono services that, that do meet that threshold for recording on the book side, they do not um, they're not they're not a tax item, so we do reverse those on the tax side. And so it's important for whoever's preparing your tax return to know, you know, what those are that are on your books, so that we're able to reduce reverse those on the tax side when they prepare the tax returns. Um, and common ones are, you know, donated uh, timeshare usage or vacation home usage. Your individual donors actually not getting a deduction for that donation. Um, you know, they they may contribute it, and you know, gets them. Um, it, you know, if it's a, it, it gets them recognition and they get to help the charity, but they don't get a deduction for that on the tax side and also on your nonprofit return, we don't recognize that. Um, some of the things that we commonly see, you know, for, for publicly traded securities, you do get the fair market value for that. And it's the mean value between the high and the low on the day that it's donated. And so like Kemp said, that's very easy. You just pull the values from the internet. You don't need to have an appraisal for those types of donations, um, even if they're rather large. Um, for mutual funds, it's the closing price on the day that it's donated. Um, but often we'll see those recorded on the financial statements and they're recorded in, a, in an account where it's not clear that they're publicly traded securities. So it is helpful to let your, know your tax team if those are securities rather than cash. And then most of the other types of donations are book and tax are the same. So we treat them the same on the tax side. That, so donations of tangible assets, inventory, clothing, equipment, uh, typically same for tax and um, audit or gap. So some things for your organization, just make sure you're, you're doing the compliance that you need for your donors, um, which is making sure you have a proper written acknowledgement, which will go over um, the quid pro quid pro quo contributions require a written disclosure of the fair value they get in return for their donation. Um, if it's an 80, if it's a, if it's an asset donated over $5,000, they have to have a qualified appraiser. Kemp went over those roles. Um, the appraiser needs to sign the form. The um, charity needs to sign the form. And then the donor needs to attach that to their tax return. So there's often some um, you know, coordination that's required between all three parties to get that proper attachment for your donor. So make sure that you're planning ahead with your donor to get that all done on time. And then if they sell the asset within... Uh, three years, they, you as a charity need to file a form 8282 to let the IRS know what that's sold for. And for vehicle donations, make sure you're filing your 1098C, B1, 
because your donor's deduction is limited to the sales proceeds unless you're using that vehicle as part of your charitable program. Um, so an example like Meals on Wheels, you know, if you're using the car to, to deliver meals to, uh, to the um, recipients of your program, you know, that's, that's different. There's an exclusion for that, but most, most charities are selling the vehicles. And so make sure you're filing that 1098C. So this is the list of the required information for your written acknowledgements. And this is extremely important for your donors because if, you, if you're missing one item, your donor's deduction is at risk. And, and on the individual side, the one we see most commonly missed is um, D. So you wanna make sure you have the name of your organization, your, the amount, if it's cash, a description if it's an on-cash donation, uh, but that statement that the goods or services, that no goods or services were provided by the organization is really important. Um, if there were no goods and services provided, and if there were goods and services, make sure you're, you're adding the good faith estimate of that, which is listed in E. Um, and so we commonly, on the individual side, we'll go back to charities or we'll go back to our, our um, individual clients and say you need to have an updated written acknowledgement because we do see the IRS disallow those deductions on audit if you don't have the proper verbiage in your statement. These make sure that your organization is is doing a statement if you're receiving donations of over $75 and there's a um, and their donor is getting something in return. And there's some de minimis rules for this, but and that would be like if they're receiving an intangible religious benefit or um, some comments like if it's a membership your membership organization and your donors have um, rights to parking, you know, at, at the museum or, or rights to come into the museum. There's certain exclusions for this. There's a de minimis role. Um, but if, if you're doing an auction and your donor, uh, for example, contributes um, $1,000 to, to purchase an item and that, that item is worth $500 they only get a deduction for $500, the difference between what they paid over fair market value. So it's important that you, you comply with this. First of all, there's a penalty if you don't, and, and also the donor needs that information in order to report that donation correctly on their tax return. And by the way, there's a, there's a great IRS publication um, that goes over these rules um, for the quid pro quo donations and your donation acknowledgements. And so um, if anybody needs that, we can send you that information, but it's, it's, um, it does a pretty good job in summary and gives examples of the written acknowledgements. So the 8283 is what your donors need to attach to their individual tax returns. And if, if they have a donation over $500, that's in-kind donations, they have to attach an 8283 to their return. And if it's under 5,000, they, they complete section A and just provide the value. If it's over 5,000, they need to have a qualified appraiser, you know, following the rules that Kemp laid out and, and make sure you have the proper signatures on the form. And if your donor does not have this information when they're filing their return, let's say, you know, they were kind of late getting their information to their tax provider and the tax provider didn't realize that they had this, you know, $10,000 donation to a charity. Um, the, the requirement is that they have the appraisal before they claim the donation on their return. So we have seen cases where it, it was last minute, they weren't aware of the requirements, so they just don't claim it on the return and they go back and amend it. And there's specific rules for doing that and being able to do that. Um, but they need to make sure that they have all the proper information and the appraisal in place before they claim the deduction on the return for that tax year. And most of the charities that I see getting um, these types of in-kind donations do a pretty good job of coordinating with their, their donor to get the proper 8283 signs, but just make sure that you're, you're reaching out to your donors if they're making those types of donations. And then the charity is required to file an 8282 if they sell that donated um, in-kind asset within three years of the contribution or two years for vehicles. So make sure you're filing the 8282 if you're getting in-kind donations worth over $5,000 and you're selling it within three years. And there's certain exceptions to that too and it does not apply to publicly traded securities. Next slide, Daniel.
Okay, this is a, a little summary of what you're required to put on a 1098C. Um, most of the charities that we know that have vehicle donation programs usually work with a third party that takes care of some of this, but I know some people do these in houses in house. So just make sure that you're filling out the 1098 appropriately. And um, if you're using it for your charitable program, there's specific boxes on the form to check so that your um, donor is aware that you're using it as part of the program and not selling it just to generate cash. And that could affect their deduction as well. But generally their deduction is limited to the sales proceeds if you're selling the asset. Next slide, Daniel. Okay, and this is just a reminder um, for any of you that are with private foundations. If your donor donates stocks to a private foundation, there's an investment excise tax that the private foundation has to pay that's um, on the difference between the sales proceeds and the donor's basis. So the private foundation inherits the donor's basis when they receive shares. So make sure you're tracking that. It's not tracked on books, but it is important for tax purposes that you track that. Um, usually when private foundations receive a stock donation, they're selling it right away or you know soon after. So it's not too much of an issue, but sometimes people will hold those assets in their portfolio for a while. Um, so it is important to track that basis because there is a tax consequence to that. And that tax rate is that is now a flat rate of 1.39. It used to be one or 2%, depending on you know certain requirements in your minimum distributions, but flat 1.39. Um, so it makes it a lot simpler now, um, but make sure that you're tracking that. And then uh, one other reminder, actually, sorry, Daniel, on that last slide. Um, if, you're, if your private foundation and your donor is contributing assets that are not publicly traded stock, like cryptocurrency, you know, we're, we're seeing more people doing that. That's not a publicly traded security. So if it's a grant making private foundation, um, they may not be getting a fair market value deduction for that. So keep that in mind. It, it, private operating foundation would, but a private grant making foundation would not. Um, so just make sure that you're, they're consulting their tax advisor before they contribute certain assets to the private foundation. Um, oh, and here, yeah, donors, just make sure that the donation will be limited to basis if it's not qualified publicly traded securities, which is really stocks and bonds. Um, and uh, contributions to private foundations for your donor have different AGI limitations. Um, the AGI limitations are really complex now because cash, you've got 60% and 50% and private foundations are subject to lower AGI limitations. Um, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. And next slide, Daniel. Okay, so for, if, you're, if you're a 990 filer and you receive non-cash contributions over 25,000, your organization has to complete Schedule M with their tax return. And that Schedule M is pretty detailed. It asks for uh, the number of each type of donation that you receive and the fair market value and how you determine that fair market value. So, um, you know, if you're doing a big auction, generally that Schedule M is probably going to apply to your organization. So make sure you're tracking all that information because um, I know some of those online auctions, they do receive a lot of volume. And once you get to that 25,000 threshold, you will need to report that on your 990. Um, and just make sure you're tracking the fair market value versus what your donor is paying for it. And keep in mind that services and facilities you'll be recognizing on your books but are, are reversed for tax purposes. So here's um, what the Schedule M asks for. Um, it, it separates the donations by type. So there's you know, different lines for food inventory and stocks and clothing and real estate and all the various other kind of unique donations that you see. It, it'll require you to disclose a number of contributions in each category and the value. And then there's some questions actually at the bottom that are designed to help the IRS know, you know, how your organization is deciding to accept gifts. So there's, there's a question about gift acceptance policy um, and whether you hire third parties to solicit process or sell the contributions. Um, and there's one, whether you have um, 
assets that you're required to hold for three years. I think they're looking for whether you're trying to, your donor is trying to avoid having that 8282 filed. Um, so just be mindful of those questions when you're taking in your donations. Cryptocurrency is all the buzz right now. So people may be seeing this and have actual live uh, instances or case studies of gifts to you. Uh, there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, so don't jump into accepting crypto gifts lightly um, un unless you have a pretty good sense of what it is that you're getting. Um, some things quickly on operating considerations. Uh, certainly think about your gift acceptance policies and your policies for liquidating such assets once contributed. Again, it's a very volatile market. You know, some assets have been up 600% and down 600%, you know, in a matter of days. So just make sure you understand what, what uh, your policies are before you, you dive right in. Um, if you happen to be holding them at any point in time and you will be holding them, uh, the, the important thing is understand how to custody them if you're gonna use a third party for that or if you're just gonna do it yourself. Uh, there's, there's some, uh, certainly if you're gonna do it yourself, there's, there's more risks there. So you need to understand a bit more. And then just from a, an investment standpoint, some people may be investing in funds and other vehicles that include cryptocurrency. And, and so understanding a bit more about what your considerations as a fiduciary, uh, say your investment committee or others before they jump into that. Um, but a lot of decisions to make from the accounting standpoint. So just a um, quick uh, overview here. Uh, again, crypto is going to be recorded at fair value, just like any other non-cash item. So you just need to understand uh, how you're going to record the fair value. If, you, if there's an intermediary involved, certainly that's more helpful than if it's just an outright donation of crypto or a, a, a less frequently used cryptocurrency. Uh, there are thousands of these. So if we're talking about Bitcoin or Ethereum or Dogecoin for people that are getting into that, uh, those definitely are more marketable and have, have more markets. Um, so just keep in mind how it is that you're gonna be receiving it. Certainly you need to keep in mind like the time of day you're gonna value if this is gonna be a regular thing for you. So uh, most people either value based on UTC time or 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, because again, this is a 24 seven market, you need to choose a, a line in the sand as to what is the, the end of day price for you. And then figuring out whether you're gonna use a pricing aggregator or not like CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko or a number of different folks, or if you're just gonna go straight to the uh, exchange itself like Coinbase to, or the like to get your value. Uh, using an aggregator is not a, a level one input. They, they are just gathering all the prices from all the exchanges around the world. So that would likely be a level two valuation. Quoted prices in active markets. Again, if we're talking about Bitcoin, Dogecoin, those types of things vary, you know, billions of dollars of value and trading uh, amounts every day. But if it's one of those others of the thousands of cryptocurrency, you need to think about whether it's an active market or not. Is this thing traded enough for me to feel I can just take the price off of the website and go run with that. So uh, keep, in, keep in mind some of those things. Uh, certainly principal and most advantageous market as well. You know, we talk about using the value from an exchange in the US like Coinbase, highly regulated, or Binance who's overseas and maybe, you know, not as regulated and versus some other exchange that um, is, again, a little more questionable. So there's hundreds of exchanges as, as well. So that's important to consider. The accounting for it is interesting. We have some options in nonprofit accounting. So um, understand each of the nuances carefully. So you figure out how you want to uh, apply those. Uh, the general, you know, the AICPA has put out a white paper that generally asks, you know, suggesting to value it as, as intangible assets. But um, again, there are options for nonprofits within nonprofit gap uh, beyond just, uh, you know, what, the, what, what is in that guide from the AICPA. Tax considerations, I know Tammy's covered a bit about this, but again, a lot of stuff is involves foreign activities. You have to understand whether you have to file an FBAR or not. Uh, you have to, again, limit your donations limited to basis. If we're talking about giving it to a private foundation, uh, if, there's, if there's issues with liquidating these assets, you have to keep that in mind, potentially for the valuation of the cryptocurrency. Um, we have some clients where there's significant amounts given and some extra re restrictions on, on, the, on the liquidation of those assets. Those all have to be taken into account when figuring out uh, what's the true market value.
you do have any other questions that you think of during the course uh, that we didn't address today, please feel free to reach out to any one of our presenters today as well.